Okay, today uh, we have a guest, uh, Diane Raptosh, who is a poet, uh, National Book Award long list winner. She's had uh, she's written six books, of which Etruscan has had the privilege of publishing now four of the trilogy. It and then um, uh, her next book is actually going to be a kind of experimental volume with two other poets. So uh, she's a distinguished poet. She's also a professor at the College of Idaho, teaching creative writing and literature. Um, welcome, Diane. Thank you. It's so great to be here. <laughs> and there. Um, and there. And we've been having a lot of fun because we've been talking about, first of all, we, uh, you can go to YouTube, folks, and see uh, Diane do several readings. One, uh, her latest book, uh, Dear Z, is, is up on YouTube and on the Etruscan site. And then she did a reading with uh, Deneen Wardrop and Karen uh, Donovan, who are com the three poets comprising Trio. So we're trying to get, we're trying to make up for the fact that we can't actually meet uh, with, the, with these meetings. But today, uh, we're going to talk about William Blake and the Proverbs of Hell, which you got to have a tattoo, you know, Proverbs of Hell. <laughs> what a great <laughs> idea. You know? I'm generally anti-tattoo for myself, but <laughs> that one I would consider. <laughs> Diane, Absolutely. Tell, tell us how, uh, how you came across the Proverbs of Hell and what, what they mean to you. Well, um, I first took, well, I, I took a course in the Romantics as a graduate student and just fell in love with William Blake and felt him to be a kindred spirit. Um, I mean, I, I don't mean that to sound uh, strange, but I, 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 I felt drawn to him because he's um, such a subversive and so subtle in his ways of being subversive, um, very socially aware, very kind-hearted, so it seems, um, bravely nonconformist, a great role model for um, not only how to aspire to be a poet, but how to be a human being um, who's, who seeks to remain awake and to remain uh, liberated and to fight for freedom um, and even achieve it in a in a brief lifetime, both for oneself and for others. Um, so I appreciated very much how he um, did what a poet is called upon to do in so many ways. One, uh, he was very adept at looking inward and outward at the same time, um, with what I like to call a poet's compound eye. He hooked his gaze simultaneously on the material conditions of the world, life in the city, while at the same time um, looking at eternity and um, all points in between. Um, he was really one of the most outrageous poets and artists of his time, regarded by his own contemporaries as a madman. Um, rebel, he rebelled against society, government, um, as well as uh, against established forms of poetry. I mean, what's not to love? <laughs> uh, his seditious ideals made him one of the most subversive writers of the Romantic era and pre-Romantic pre era. And there were plenty of um, subversive ideas um, being, being flown in that, in that time period. So although once he was briefly tried for uttering seditious remarks, uh, due to his uncanny ability to transform um, his ideas into very subtle poetry, uh, he, he didn't experience car incarceration, um, just was tried. What I appreciate um, perhaps most about, about his work is how, how subtly and how artfully he's able to convey these very um, subversive ideas. And that inspired me to try to do the same in, in my work. Poetry I, is, um, in my view, the best genre for, um, for seditious thinking. It's the best genre for um, reconceiving the world and expressing possibilities because poetry brings to the fore the full gamut of language in a way that other genres might not. So 
so thoroughly. Um, the formal properties of language, the sounds of language, the, the subversive, the potentially subversive rhythms of language, um, ideas you can express, express in language that if people are too impatient will miss in poetry. Um, and he was a master at uh, creating this kind of work that, that entirely unraveled systems of thought, systems of religious belief, systems of cruelty, and he replaced them with his own systems. I've aspired to that my whole life, both as a poet and as a human being, and I, I really have William Blake to thank, among a few others. Um, you know, that, that brings up so much, Diane. First of all, the excitement of right having you see your whole life. <laughs> um, you're, uh, well, I think we're getting some background, but um, so I was thinking, you know, as a young person, when you, you know, when you first hear these things, they, they're just so explosive. I mean, I was a sophomore, yeah. I remember when I first read The Marriage oh. of Heaven and Hell, and I was like, oh, okay. In this case, <laughs> I'm going to make some changes. And yeah. uh, just so excited about, uh, you know, hearing uh, some of those proverbs that, that we talk about. And it's interesting that you found that in that a template for your own work, which also, in a sense, I think does address that dual way of looking at the world, both at eternity and also at the social issues. That's a difficult thing to bridge. So many poets wind up you know, in, the, in the Robert Frost, you might say, mode, of, you know, being in nature, or other poets, you know, being uh, with Amiri Baraka, or, you know, who you think of as a social poet. But to bring those two things together, um, how is it's that? Hard to, it's, it's hard to do. And everybody assumes I'm going to be a nature poet because I live in Idaho. And I love Idaho and I do love nature, but I, I'm just called to write a different kind of poetry, I feel. And Blake set the template. I'm so glad I had exposure to him and I'm so glad I never outgrew that, that uh, rebellious teenage impulse to, to subvert and to, to never stop dreaming about how things can be. The imagination is, is an inherently subversive faculty. And the romantics were particularly good at pointing that out. Blake, a master at pointing that out. And I never ever wanted to outgrow that, that, that faculty. And I, I think that I never will. And I encourage students never to outgrow that. Uh, we need our imagination now, perhaps more than ever, uh, to help us through the, the, the several crises that we face. Um, when we were talking to Bob Mooney, whom, of course, you know uh, about, about Blake, he said uh, he was quoting Oscar Wilde and said uh, that the... the, the, the I have a quote by Oscar Wilde, but I'm going to... Yes, sorry to interrupt, uh, but yeah, there were two peas in a pod. I, I beat you to the Wilde quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said... I'm, yeah, and, 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 I'm stealing from Mooney, so... Uh, but uh, he, you know, and, and he's, a, as part of these lectures, uh, the students will see this. He says that the, 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 the paradox of, of, of mankind is that uh, the, the, the soul is born old and grows young, but the body is young and grows old. And he says, Blake never lost that, um, uh, that sense of being a child. And... Um, so let's hear, um, your, let's hear your wild quote. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say that I, I feel that the, um, the poet is an experienced innocence, uh, which is something, actually, that's a line from Dear Z. And, and I know that what helped me come to that conclusion was William Blake. And my line from... Um, Oscar Wilde is uh, that man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. Wow. And I, that's why I'm always drawn toward the uh, form of the dramatic monologue. Um, there's so much to be done with the dramatic monologue. I think every poem is, a, is in essence a dramatic monologue. The, the devil that, that Blake gets to take on um, to express his own views is so liberating and the character you know I so I create characters in the spirit of that devil um, that seditious 
soft, sprite sort of uh, voice. And it's incredibly liberating because it's, it's, it's not me, whoever that is, and I can dispense with any concern about that from the beginning. And I am entirely set free. And maybe readers are too. So that but, was my Oscar Wilde. Let, let, I would love to hear uh, one of the dramatic monologues, perhaps from Dear Z or American Amnesiac or Human Directional. Or... Um, in, okay, sure. Uh, well, American Amnesiac, which you mentioned, is, is a work in the... I've been studying America, as did William Blake himself, um, the during you know he studied he watched the French Revolutions yes. got the pair the poem of America, America a again, yes he was he was uh, he was obsessed with the idea of freedom as as many poets are and um, I myself have been studying America as an armchair historian um, and as a citizen as a concerned citizen and what I could see coming when Barack Obama was elected president was all kinds of trouble that we're now facing because the United States has had neglected to do the necessary internal work to appreciate and honor um, a black man as president. And as soon as he was elected, I just thought to myself, you know, all hell's going to break loose. And so what I wanted to do was, was to get inside the psyche of an older, established, straight, white, affluent man, um, the likes of whom would be so reluctant to accept the new shades of America um, and reluctant equally, or perhaps more so to uh, say, all right, my time is done. And my moments of supremacy have lasted quite a, quite a long time and I'm ready to I'm ready to share. So I wanted to retool the psyche of such a person and in doing so, uh, create a better human um, in that person and also to reconceive nation state in a, um, in a kinder and more empathetic way. Those are tall orders, but you know, poets are supposed to dream big as William Blake encourages us. So I'll read one uh, example poem. It's in the voice of, of John Doe, an everyday amnesiac, I guess we could call him. Um, he was formerly named Calvin Reinhardt, so you'll, you'll hear a reference to that. It's written very loosely in the puzzle form. It's, it's an ancient Arabic form. They're, they're like leaping couplets. Every couplet is like its own individual poem almost. Um, they're, they're not perfect in that form, they don't stick to that form religiously, but um, there's a lot of leaping, which I hope also enacts the, the mind activity, the mind energies of an amnesiac. So uh, I'm, I swear I'm gonna read this poem. Um, <laughs> sometimes people, I'm very interested in the proverb as a, as a kind of um, model for what a sentence can do. Uh, in a way, every line of poetry aspires to be a proverb, perhaps it's fair to say. So John Doe in this book sometimes utters his own proverbs, and sometimes he quotes other people, sometimes they're proverbs, sometimes they're not. But you hear things said in the, in the mainstream media, for example, that sound like, um, oh, necessary inevitabilities, right? Oh, we needed slavery because that's how we built the country. And, and people come to accept such statements as, as true. And poets like to take down these kinds of statements um, and break them apart and replace them with what the, the kinds of statements that the, imagine knows to be, the imagination knows to be possible. All right. We have to tolerate inequality as a way to gain prosperity for all. Someone told me, Goldman Sachs, Lord Griffiths said, at, La at London's Southwark Church last fall. What kind of sense is this? I can't remember a thing I did for that firm, but it says on my CV that I advised for them. 
Here's a thin cut of wisdom. The kinder you are, the stronger your immune system. And don't forget oysters, dark meat, the day's breath of garlic. Carelessness can ruin months of growth. My old best friend, Jen Byers, says there's such a job as being minister of leaves of tea. If someone were to ask which ancient figure I'd most like to meet, I'd say the Constitution, as it is a living document. Get on the page with me. I recall the end of Reinhardt's last consulting phase as if it were my wife's first look. At each momentous stage of his life, a Sioux Indian earns a new name. Jumping Badger landed the tag Sitting Bull on killing his first bison. Unfriend was just dubbed Word of the Year. The name's John Doe, and I'm just lying doggo here on wheezing earth. <laughs> wow, wow. So many echoes of voices, Diane, in that. And of course, it's part of a whole series of things. And as, as you're saying, I'm hearing also uh, the, the kinds of, of echoes of lines, echoes of, of, of uh, you know, the conventions of lines, certainly the rhymes you know, jump out when you hear them. And, um, and I think of Blake also just deconstructing, not just the line, but perhaps as you have done here, just deconstructing the, the sense that, that syntax or a single narrative or a single uh, uh, hierarchy have to hold a poem or a life together. Exactly. Um, the, the notion, where's, I've got all these prepared notes, but it's so much fun to just stray from <laughs> them. Um, his ideas about order, and even the world of poetry's ideas about order, and he was so good at subverting both of those worlds of order. Um, you know, as you know, or as you'll be discussing with your students, the, the angels of heaven in his system symbolize whatever limits and confines. The uh, priests, policemen, prudence, logic, um, and in metaphysics, the belief in an objective world. Uh, his devils, the inspired creators, are the opposite of angels. And um, through the voice of the devil, he brings in the bodily part of existence, the senses um, that should not be underrated or suppressed because they're an essential creative energy. So um, the angels represent the masculine concerted and controlling energy, which in his view seeks to contain and constrain genius and put order to things. And, and yes, poetry is a way of putting order to things, but we live in a pretty chaotic world and so, too much order feels artificial and untrue to the, to the, to the nature of, of how things are. And we're all amnesiacs in a certain sense. We're very short memoried. We're, we're trained by culture to move from one thing to another very quickly um, and also to forget our history very quickly because it's, it's in the interest of power that we do so. You know, thinking of those angels too, the, the, the masculine, the order, the, the, the sad thing about that, of course, is that they also demand and, and are, are beset by separateness. You know, they, they're looking down at what they see as chaos. And of course, Blake says, well, right. what to you looks like chaos is really eternal delight. And, and isn't that, I mean, Joseph Campbell talks about this, the, 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 the uh, Hindu mythology talks about this, that actually jumping into the chaos turns it into ambrosia. And if without the jumping in, 
that you are always going to be in that separate uh, hierarchical capitalist yep. in, in equal, unequal. You know, the idea that, oh, we all must be, we must be unequal. Uh, but it's inevitable. It, <laughs> it is inevitably so. They yes. will try to tell us. Yes. It is inevitable. That's just how things are. Yes. That's how things always have been. And the and the poet said Blake says no, mm -mm. no. you know right. no. Look, I can conceive of an order in my short lifetime that's far better than what we're told is inevitable and the natural order of things. Why should it be that? Somebody made that up. Several somebodies. So our job is to recreate something that's better. And I think it's highly ironic, too, that so many times when people talk about poetry, they talk about it in Apollonian or angelic terms as something so highly ordered that it is beyond them. And, oh, you know, poetry, oh, that's very the high brow is even the, you know, the yeah. colloquial word used. And yes. the irony of it is that, of course, it's the opposite. It is the engagement of the energy that says, I have no idea what's coming next, and I'm okay with that. Right. <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily high, at all highbrow. It's, it's all the brows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Unibrow and, and multiple brows. Right, right, right. And, of course, Blake, you know, having, uh, I, I, you know, for myself, uh, you know, spe speaking to that 19-year-old, um, you know, boy that I was, he was really one of the first poets that I saw, that I, I could immediately connect to and, and say, wow, I want to say this to people. And, and I find it also amazing, especially in our world today, um, that here's Blake 200 years ago, quite willing to confront literally the most important and hierarchical and conventional and, and set upon a standard Christianity. Yeah. You know, and he could have given, like, he, you know, he, in the four Zoas, he gives you know, names to all your reason and, you know, uh, Belial and all these other na different names, not Belial, I can't remember the other names, but, but he, you know, he, he, in order to, to create, recreate them, but in the marriage of heaven and hell, he's right on top of, you know, he's using the, the Christian mythology and you can only imagine, I mean, I, I think people are shocked today. Uh, you know, oh yeah. And you can only imagine then how, how they would have been completely appalled. It was amazing. His house wasn't burned down. <laughs> It, 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 it was amazing, for sure, yes. Let me just read a little of um, marriage just to have concrete lines that students can um, plug into. So in marriage, Blake states, all Bibles or sacred codes have been the causes of the following errors. One, that man has two real existing principles these a body and a soul. Two, that energy called evil is alone from the body and that reason called good is alone from the soul. Three, that God will torment man in eternity for following his energies. Mm -hmm. But the following contraries to these are true, says Blake. One, Man has no body distinct from his soul. For that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. Two, energy is the only life and is from the body. And reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Three, Energy is eternal delight. Wow. And, you know, as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling other, uh, 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 other great writers who tried to subvert the conventions and, and had such a difficult time. And partly I realized one of the attributes that Blake had, he was a publisher. He was a printer. He could put this out himself. He didn't have to do what James Joyce did, you know, creep from door to door trying to get something published over the course of 17 years and having it cut and, you know, mangled and, and manipulated. And, and in those beautiful, which the students will see, the beautiful uh, prints yeah. that, Blake, that Blake did, you know, as an, oh. engra as an engraver and an artist, not only did he uh, break bounds of poetry, but also between genres. And I think Brilliant. of, Genius. of uh, 
of, of your work in a breaking form, but also, you know, you took such care and participation in all the artistic aspects of the uh, production of uh, those. Of the, yeah, the, that's the that's... trilogy, which I think is another link between uh, your genre breaking and Blake's genre breaking. It has to do with taking responsibility for bringing these transgressions to fruition, to say, I'm going to say this, I'm going to, and I'm going to make the, whatever powers have to happen in order to, to be able to do it. You know, instead of being kind of helpless and on the other end <clears throat> of the writing uh, For sure. game. So, and thankfully, um, you're cutting out a you're cutting out a little bit. I know, yeah, we're we're we're, we're losing we're losing energy. <laughs> but um uh you know that that's the 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 thing that I I I find most remarkable is is both the fact that you as a poet are finding these lines both self-renewing, immediate and inspirational to work which is on the cutting edge of today's contemporary poetry. And this is 200, 220 years ago that this, that this came about. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to tell one little story that I haven't had a chance. When I was in grad school, we had to take one of those research courses, you know, how to do research. This is before Google. <laughs> you know, uh huh, yeah. Before, when, when, the, when the internet was still a, 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 gl a glimmer in Al uh, Gore's eye, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, we had to go, the question that I was given was, uh, Research the source of the story that William Blake and his wife would uh, stay in their garden naked in order to recreate uh, the Garden of Eden. Is it a true story or not? And unfortunately, I never was able to track that down, whether a true story or not. And to this day, I, I'm declaring it. I'm finally going to declare it true. That it's a true story. <laughs> I'm gonna. I have no research at all based to, to base that on. But, uh, that it exists as a story makes it true enough. That's the only that, truth that matters. I think that's what Blake would say. Is you know when, when he asks Ezekiel, you know he says, "What about all your lost work?" And and Ezekiel says, "Well, nothing, nothing of equal value is lost. What we have, we have." You know? yeah. So, Diane, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're so uh, welcome. And uh, we look forward to um, the next volume, Trio, which is coming out in 2021. And we, uh, we wish you the, the best in this difficult semester. Upcoming. Oh, it should be okay. It should be okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we're going to be safe at any rate. So, yeah. And thank you for your inspiration. And uh, we Oh, will, thank you. We will cross paths Thank you again. for helping... Generations of, of uh, students continue to love poetry and literature. I am not.